So I want to get started to maximize uh, the time for uh, our uh, speaker. Maybe I'll also pivot this a little so that nobody on either side of the room is, is uh, slighted. So let me welcome you all uh, to our seminar on ethical, legal, and social implications uh, of uh, genetics. Uh, let me give you a, a quick plug for next month's session. Uh, Jim Tiberi, who is a uh, philosopher by training uh, and has uh, written uh, a great deal, including a, a very interesting book about uh, behavioral genetics, uh, will be here from the University of Utah. Jim works closely with their developing center of uh, uh, studies on uh, the ethical uh, and related implications of, of genetics. Uh, and if you're interested in today's talk, you'll be interested in Jim's talk uh, as well, as well, because it sort of takes it chronologically to the next stage. Uh, Jim will be focusing on uh, issues related to uh, parenting and uh, what, <clears throat> what the consequences uh, may be for uh, genetically informed uh, parenting as we move uh, forward into the, uh, the brave new world of, of the future. So that's January 7th, same time, same place. And uh, we'll be getting an announcement about it out uh, very shortly with uh, the title and, and more details uh, about the talk. Uh, today, uh, however, I'm, I'm uh, delighted uh, to welcome Ron Wapner. Uh, Ron uh, is a professor here in the department's uh, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, where he's also the Vice Chair uh, for Research and Director uh, of Reproductive uh, Genetics. Uh, Ron has been absolutely uh, in the forefront uh, of uh, developments in prenatal uh, testing of uh, fetuses, genetic testing of, of fetuses. Uh, many of you saw uh, the article uh, on which he was uh, first author in the New England Journal of Medicine probably about a year ago now, reporting uh, some of the results from this mega study uh, that he's leading, which, which really is uh, a fascinating exploration of uh, the use of and the consequences of uh, uh, multi-array testing in, in prenatal uh, diagnosis. Uh, so we are uh, delighted to have him uh, here. The title for his talk today is Prenatal Diagnosis, uh, How Much uh, Should We Know? That's his picture up on the screen. Uh, right now. <laughs> Thank you. Ron. I don't know what the thing should be. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
these really are problems, although they're not, I guess, really problems, but they've occurred because the changes in the genetic tools that are available and have become available in the last three to five years have been amazing. And all of you, or those of you who work in the area of genetics, know that the companies that are out there that are providing genetic information have just continued uh, to multiply uh, incredibly rapidly. And many of these companies have salespeople that are going to general uh, physicians' offices telling them, you ought to use our test, you ought to use this test, you ought to do that, uh, with little if no consideration uh, about the appropriateness of some of these tests uh, for patients, and with no, in, in, at least in reproductive medicine, no evaluation of what the patients really want. So what I thought I would talk about today is review one of the dilemmas, and that is what tools we use for evaluating uh, the fetus for prenatal testing, um, and then why it's become such an conundrum of how we use these tools and how we implement them. Um, the whole discussion uh, the whole discussion is going to deal with this. Now every time I show this slide somebody knows the movie that this is from. Um, somebody has. It's from the Karate Kid. Uh, you knew, right? And the, the theme of the Karate Kid is balance. And this is a picture where he's on a boat trying to learn how to put one foot on each side and not tip over into the water. So the reason I show this is our discussion today is going to be balance between all the genomic information that we have and what would be appropriate and what we should be giving to our patients and using to develop, to evaluate a developing uh, pregnancy. And this is the dilemma more closely related, and that is over the, um, again, certainly last five years, uh, we've developed incredible tools so that we can identify all chromosomal abnormalities of the fetus, but as was alluded to, we now have the ability to identify microdeletions and duplications, much, much smaller uh, pieces of information. And we really could, if we wanted, we could sequence the fetus and get level or information at that detail level. And we actually, for many cases, are already starting to do that. Simultaneously with this, another new technology developed and that's the ability not to have to do a procedure to get this information. We can actually send the woman to the lab, draw blood from her, and in three days identify whether the fetus has one of a number of major chromosomal abnormalities. And the abnormalities, and we'll talk a little about this, are easily diagnosed nowadays by a blood test from the mom, are the major common aduploides, trisomies 21, 18, 13, and most of the sex chromosome abnormalities. So we have markedly improved diagnostic capabilities and we have a markedly less invasive way to get a more limited amount of information. And what differentiates this is only the risk of getting the information. That's the risk of doing a diagnostic procedure. And as, as again, I'll go over a little more in detail, that's a very, very small risk, but a risk that has been magnified now that we have a non-invasive way to get things, a risk that people used to be willing to take, but many, many, many at the present time are unwilling to take. So that's the dilemma of the balance. How do we balance screening for abnormalities, uh, for a limited number of abnormalities, versus doing diagnostic testing for much more information? We'll start by talking about the invasive tests, and this just shows you how really naive we always are. And this is from an article in Lancet in 1977, and this was when amniocentesis for prenatal testing was in its infancy. And at that time, the article, which is one of the 
highest prestige journals then and still is, said virtually all chromosomal aberrations can be detected by amniocentesis in 1977. And this is what chromosomes look like in 1977. These big black blobs. Uh, banding had just started. Um, we still would, I remember standing in the lab and arguing, is that a number 21 or 22? Sometimes we couldn't even tell the difference between chromosomes, but we thought now we can identify all fetal chromosomal aberrations, and what we could identify were too many chromosomes, aneuploidy, or too little chromosomes, or major abnormalities. Um, with time, we've evolved from this, and this is just a diagnosis of Down syndrome with pretty bad chromosomes, to the ability to really um, look at much more depth. And with banding, um, we really could see much smaller deletions, duplications, inversions, missing pieces, small translocations, um, etc. But we were always looking under the microscope. So we were limited by the ability of light microscopy and the ability to see very small changes. But it was a dramatic improvement. And with time, we were able to give parents more and more information about their pregnancy. Well, about now, it's almost uh, 10 years ago, we stopped doing, didn't stop, we learned that there are other ways than doing a karyotype and looking at the chromosomes under a microscope, we moved from karyotyping to what I would call molecular karyotyping, in which um, we don't need a light microscope at all. And what we do is we are able to take the chromosomes, cut them into as many little pieces as you would like to, put these pieces onto a chip, and then take a sample from the patient and ask whether or not a piece of the patient, in this case it would be either amniotic fluid or chorionic villi, is either overrepresented uh, duplication or whether or not it is missing, which would be a deletion. Well, it, when we started, we actually used to do just that. We used to cut up the chromosomes, we used to put them in bacteria or yeast, and we used to have to find them and stick them um, on the chip. Nowadays, you don't have to do that. Now that we have the sequencing of the human genome, uh, you just have technology, which is somewhat like a uh, jet ink printer, that you just say, I want you to put CATCTG or whatever the sequence you want here, and then put another sequence here. So we can actually take small, very small segments um, from the genome and put them on an array which is this chip, and then ask whether or not the test subject, which is either the fetus or that we can do this in adults, has too much or too little. Uh, this is represented by differences in color, a computer reads it. So this is really what a karyotype looks like nowadays. You don't see any chromosomes at all, but this is all the little pieces from number one chromosome, because obviously when you put them on, the computer knows exactly where they are and can tell you which piece is missing or overrepresented. So this would be pieces from chromosome one, two, three, four, et cetera. So again, we've dramatically improved our ability to see smaller and smaller changes um, in missing or overrepresented pieces in the genome. So karyotype, even in the best of hands, and God knows the hands we have here are really incredibly good, the resolution is somewhere around 7 to 10 million base pairs. In other words, if there is a deletion or something missing that is smaller than 10 million base pairs, you won't see that. This morning we reviewed a case in which there was 11 million base pairs um, that were missing and somebody still wasn't able to see that under the light microscope. But in general, with a prenatal test, about 10 million base pairs, which is a lot of DNA, would have to be altered before we could see. With chromosomal microarray, we are only limited by how many of those probes, how many of those pieces of DNA we can put onto a chip, and you can put two million or so now, so that we can actually see changes if we wanted to um, uh, on a research basis, 500,000 base pairs, 100,000, and now there are some techniques where we can see missing or overrepresented things of 30 base pairs. So we really, although clinically we usually look at 
things that are more like two or three hundred thousand base pairs or small. So really, we've got an incredibly improved technology that allows us to see smaller and smaller things. The, the question is, do we care? Is there any clinical value to this? And the answer, which has been developed over the past 10 years, is absolutely yes. Um, we learned that there are a number of microdeletion syndromes an assortment of um, a number of abnormalities all caused by the same genetic disorder that were just too small to be recognized until we had microarray technology. Some of these may be very well known to you. The George syndrome, which is a missing piece from the um, long arm of chromosome 22 that has heart defects and a number of other problems. Three and a half million base pairs. Could never be seen by karyotyping. Um, miller deeker which is a very severe brain malformation in which children have really severe cognitive difficulties, much smaller than 10 million base pairs, prater Willie, smith McGinnis, etc. All of these were only recognized once we had the ability to find smaller and smaller missing microdeletions. So from the standpoint of syndromes that previously we didn't know the etiology, we now do. However, in the past five or six years, We've learned not only are there syndromes associated to this, but there are non-syndromic single findings. We know that if you're missing a piece of the short arm of chromosome number 16, these children have a significant <coughs> risk of a number of cognitive difficulties, including autism, um, ADHD, a, a number of different things. We know that if you're missing a piece, some other piece on chromosome 16, it's associated with intellectual disabilities, schizophrenia, etc. And look at the size of these things. These things are 500,000 base pairs. These are much, much smaller. This has gotten to the point where for a child who has neurocognitive abnormalities or dysmorphic features or congenital anomalies, we don't even do a character. We go straight to a microarray. And the reason was that there have been studies that have taken children who had those three things. They had either neurocognitive difficulties, um, dysmorphic abnormal features, or numbers of congenital anomalies. They all had their karyotype done. In every case, the karyotype was, did I say something wrong? No, no, no. I'm no, just no. checking. The, the two of them are two of the best genetic counselors we have, so I always look to them to see if I'm making a mistake. Thank you for my validation. Um, the um, point was that in those cases, even though the chromosomes were completely normal and the parents would have been told there's no genetic cause of what you have, in somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of those cases, there was a smaller microdeletion or duplication causing that problem. So microarrays can tell you everything that a karyotype uh, can tell you, um, but also can give you a lot more information. So, we have a new technology that can show us much more higher resolution, and that new technology gives us a lot more clinically relevant information. So yes, it is important, I think would be the bottom. So let's talk a little bit about how we already have implemented this into clinical care. And if you look at a child by ultrasound, a fetus actually, who has a structural anomaly <coughs> and an entirely normal karyotype. Then you do an array, and the studies have been very, very consistent. About 6% of the time, despite a normal karyotype for a fetus with a structural anomaly, you will find a microdeletion or duplication that is causing the structural anomalies that you see on ultrasound. So this is an example of how this alters how we talk to patients. Um, this is a heart by ultrasound at around 18 weeks of um, pregnancy. Um, this is the um, left ventricle of the heart, the right ventricle. This is the septum that's supposed to be dividing the left from the right. There's a really big hole there, um, which you can see right there. This is the aorta that should be coming out of the left ventricle only, but it's coming out right in the middle. It's an overriding aorta, and this is a tetralogy of phylum. I can tell you what happens when the ultrasound shows the tetralogy of flow here. The cardiovascular surgeons run down to the ultrasound room and they say, Mrs. Smith, you are so lucky you are at Columbia and New York Presbyterian Hospital. We are the best surgeons, I think I'm exaggerating, we are the best surgeons in the world. We can fix this heart without any difficulty. And they are 100% correct. They really are good 
and they can fix the structural abnormality. But if we look and test this particular pregnancy, we learned that it wasn't just a heart defect, that um, it was heart abnormality was just a marker for an underlying genetic defect. And in this particular case, there was a missing piece of chromosome, the long arm of chromosome 22 associated with the um, de George or the cardiovelofacial syndrome. Now, this is what the syndrome means, that the heart was only a marker for it. Almost all, if not all, of these children have some learning disability, about a third of which would be severe. They also have a number of other abnormalities, like palatal, that we sometimes can't see by ultrasound. They frequently will have calcium problems that if treated or not recognized in the nursery can be a severe problem. But the thing that has surprised all of this is about one in four of them also have some psychotic disorder. About one in four will have schizophrenia. And who would have ever thought that you would see a cardiac defect and schizophrenia associated to the same gene abnormality? And if you talk to people that take care of these children, they don't talk about the heart defect. The most difficult part of these children is the severe schizophrenia or other um, psychotic disorders that occur in late adolescence to early adulthood. So the discussion with these parents is no longer, yes, we can fix your child's heart, which was what we would have told them if we had only had karyotyping, to these are the problems that you will have to understand might be available and how can we, or might be there, and how can we manage them. So that's one thing we learned. The more information, the better we get at giving parents some understanding of what it means. This is a, a really simple um, club foot. Here's the lower portion of the leg, here's the heel, here's the foot. We see club feet a lot. And when we see them, our general counseling has usually, until recently, been, we see club feet a lot. They're not likely to be associated with a major karyotype abnormality. Maybe you want to have an amnio, maybe you don't want to have an amnio. It's really not one of those things that has a high risk of having the major chromosome abnormalities. Well, in this particular case, the woman had an amnio. She actually, well, we were right that it has a normal 46XY karyotype, but the child also was missing 1.4 million, um, actually had a gain, a duplication of 1.4 million base pairs on the long arm of chromosome number seven. This occurs so frequently that there's already a 7Q11.23 microduplication syndrome. These fetuses have a relatively similar facial appearance. Many of them will have a simple club foot, but they all have developmental and neurocognitive difficulties. So what we are learning is as we have more and more ability to look at the um, a genome, things that we used to think weren't genetic, the subtle findings we see on ultrasound will be genetic so that we now start doing invasive testing for any patient that has any abnormalities. It used to be we would see the abnormality and we would decide whether it was likely to be associated with a severe chromosome problem, but now we've learned even subtle abnormalities such as this case, physical abnormalities can have very, very significant implications. Um, this is an example of what I find to be absolutely paradigm switching. The way we have worked until recently in prenatal diagnosis, we would do an ultrasound, we would find an anomaly, we would scratch our head, and we would say, what are the genetic tests that we should do in order to find out if there is an underlying genetic cause? In other words, we would find the phenotype, and then we would start looking for the genotype. The world has changed. Frequently now, we will have the genotype and we know what's going to develop in ultrasound weeks later so we can predict the phenotype. And this is an example. This is a woman, because of her age, had a CVS in the first trimester of pregnancy. The karyotype was normal, but the array showed that there was a missing piece from the long arm of chromosome number 17. At the time, the ultrasound looked completely normal, but we knew in this deletion was the gene, TCF2 deletion, which is associated with renal cysts, maturity onset diabetes, um, and a lot of these kids have significant neurocognitive difficulties. 
So she said, come on, guys. This is a new test. I don't really believe you. Everything looks good on the ultrasound. So we knew what we would see six weeks later. We said, come back at 16 weeks. And this is a 16-week ultrasound. And this is the fetal chest. This would be the lower fetal abdomen. And these are the kidneys. Incredibly enlarged, very, very bright kidneys. So in this case, we had the genotype long before we had the phenotype so that the whole paradigm is switching for knowing, even in fetuses, um, knowing what to expect. So this has significant clinical implications because A, we can tell parents long before the structural anomaly shows up what might be there. But second of all, these look exactly like what we see with autosomal recessive polycystic kidney disease. Because they're autosomal recessive, they occur in, recur in one in four um, pregnancies. But with this information, we knew that this was not something that would recur, so we could actually give them more, more uh, appropriate information. But again, we're showing a genetic tool that is actually changing the way we practice medicine. So, this is cool. We can use and diagnose structural abnormalities. The question is, shouldn't we offer this to every pregnant woman? So as part of the studies we did, um, on anybody that was having prenatal testing um, for either maternal age, positive first trimester screening, or just because the mother was anxious and wanted genetic information, not only did we do a karyotype, but we also did a microarray. And listed here are the cases in which the karyotype was completely normal. And we've now done about 5,000 cases. We've done two separate studies. Um, have over 5,000 cases in which there was nothing suspicious about the pregnancy. Walk in off the street sequential series. And of those, 1.1%, over 1% of children had a pathogenic copy number variant. That means deletion or duplication. And what do I mean by pathogenic? None of these were of uncertain significance. All of these had well-documented phenotypes that would cause a significant problem for the child. So I said, first time I looked at the data, I said, come on, this is crazy. You're telling me that more than 1% of children have a significant genetic abnormality most of these have some cognitive impairment associated. <coughs> Many of them um, uh, do. And it, it was worrisome. But then I started to think, what's the frequency of autism? One in 88 pregnancies. Some studies now show one in 80 pregnancies. The frequency of children with the need early intervention for learning or some other cognitive difficulty is 15% of children wind up having some developmental problem, and 3% of children have some severe problem. So this is not a surprising number. This is kind of just a very small proportion of all those children. So what we're really learning is the causes of lots of things that we have seen before. But in this case, we're now able to give that information to parents very early in pregnancy. So obviously. Many of you are sitting there saying, well, wait a minute. Should we be giving this information? Why would I want to know that my child's going to have autism or have a learning disorder? Well, there's a lot of good reasons that we would want to know this. First of all, some of these things are incredibly severe, incredibly severe with severe mental retardation and intellectual disability. And parents might want to make a decision not to continue a pregnancy. But more importantly, a lot of these things, if you do intervention, it will make a difference. There's now a number of studies that show that children that are autistic, the early the intervention, you can significantly improve the functionability, if that's a word. We know that early intervention makes a giant difference for children that are going to have learning disabilities. And that's one of the things we do for every child or offer for every child with trisomy 21, which is Down syndrome. So knowing this information very early really allows us to make a difference because we can intervene and change the course before there are symptoms and when we can actually make that difference. So really what we're doing is we're doing personalized medicine for fetuses in utero. Now, you're probably saying, well, come on. When you tell a mom her child has a risk for autism or some of these, don't they all terminate the pregnancy? The answer is absolutely not. The vast majority of patients that we have 
told information like this, said, thank you very much, I'll share it with my pediatrician, and they worked on a treatment plan. Three out of four have actually done this. So really, we have to stop thinking about prenatal testing as having two options, when the only thing we found by prenatal testing were really bad stuff, too many chromosomes. It was a test, either decide you want to continue the pregnancy or you want to terminate the pregnancy. We are now in a position where we're giving information to people that can actually be acted upon and can make a difference in the outcome and the management of the child. And that's how we have to start thinking about prenatal testing. The, you know, the issue of terminating a pregnancy is no longer the only option that people have. This is important information that will make gigantic differences. So we just have to start thinking about it a little bit differently. Okay, so that's what we can get out of invasive testing. Um, around, well, I can see it here, if I could read, 1997, I think it was. Yeah, 1997, we realized something that we hadn't known before. For years, we were involved trying to make a non-invasive prenatal diagnosis, and we were really trying to get fetal cells, because we know all pregnant women have a few fetal cells um, circulating in their uh, circulation when they're pregnant, but there's very few. There's about 10 per 10 million total cells. So the success rate was pretty bad, and while we were doing that, we would spin it down, we would look at this layer, which is where the cells are, and we would toss the plasma down the sink. Well, we learned, read about 19, the late uh, 90s, uh, early 2000s, that in the plasma, there was cell-free DNA floating around. Now, what we mean by cell-free DNA is just what it says. It was not in cells, it was actually small 150 or so base pair fragments of DNA. It was not DNA that was from entirely from the mother. A portion of that was cell-free fragments of DNA from the fetus. About 10% of the fragments were fetal, and about 90% of the fragments were maternal. Um, so the question came up, wow, 10% of the cell-free DNA in the mom's circulation is from the fetus. Can we make a genetic diagnosis looking at that? And the answer is absolutely lo and behold. It's a misnomer that it is fetal DNA. It's actually placental DNA. It comes from apoptosis, which is programmed cell death. Every placenta early in pregnancy remodels. Some of the cells die, some of the cells grow. So that's where it was coming from. So that we now are able to take those pieces of fragments of DNA, we can put them into a sequencer, and the sequencer can then tell us from which chromosome those fragments come. And we then can say, well, how many of those fragments come from chromosome 21? Because if it were Down syndrome, there would be extra DNA because there'd be an extra chromosome 21 in those 10% of uh, fragments from the fetus. So if you put them in a sequencer, you can count 10 million fragments and we can see whether or not there's extra DNA. So indeed, using that technique, which is called mass parallel sequencing, we can tell whether a pregnant woman has too much DNA um, from any particular chromosome, and if she does, that's demonstrating to us that it's coming from the fetus. So over the last 10 years, this technology has continued to evolve. And as you can see here, this is the detection rate of Down syndrome with DNA drawn from the mother. The detection rate, and these are the a number of studies, and there's actually some more recent ones, but 99 to 100% of the time, we can diagnose Down syndrome by blood drawn from the mother. About 98% of the time, we can diagnose trisomy 18 and about 96% of the time trisomy 13. This is a screening test. We cannot do it with reliability. Once in a while, we will have a test that says that it's Down syndrome or 21 or, or trisomy 18 and 13 in which the fetus will be normal, and we will miss cases. About 1% of the time, there will be a trisomy that um, the mother is carrying, but it won't show up. But that's a phenomenal screening test. 99% sensitivity, 0.1 to 0.01% specificity. So the false positive rates are incredibly low. Now, let's compare um, what this has done over time. 
when I started, and I'm not quite that old, back in the 60s, the only way we screened for Down syndrome is we asked the mother how old she was. If she said she was over 35, she was at risk for Down syndrome because it occurs more frequently um, in, in older women, and we would offer her invasive testing. Using age alone as a screening test, we could identify about 30% of trisomy 21 Down syndrome pregnancies, but in order to do that, we would have to do 100 amnios or CBS to identify one pregnancy. Most recently, until about three years ago, we started using a combination of the mother's age, the levels of certain biochemicals, some ultrasound findings, and we got lots better so that we could identify about 85 to 90 percent of Down's syndrome, but still we would have to do about 25 amnios to identify one affected pregnancy. Now that we can look at the cell or look at the cell-free DNA, we can identify 99 percent of Down syndrome pregnancies and we only have to do four invasive procedures. So the number of invasive procedures we have to do has fallen 25 fold and despite doing way less procedures, we can identify way more affected pregnancies. However, this is a screening test, it's not a diagnostic test, so there are false positives and false negatives, and it's only available right now for trisomies 13, 18, 21, and the sex chromosome abnormalities. The reason is, it's a technical reason, if you have a whole extra chromosome, you're going to have extra DNA from lots of regions on that whole chromosome. If it were a tiny little piece, like we talked about with microdeletions, um, you would have to count so many little fragments to see whether that little piece was missing that it's just not um, clinically feasible. But because we were able to do this, there has been an incredible number of new companies, and four of them are listed here, that have developed the technology, they have run to the obstetrician's office, and they have said to the obstetrician, we have this test for genetic diseases of the fetus, you should offer it to all of your patients. They don't say we have a test for trisomy 18, 13, and 21. They just say that it's for genetic diseases, that's what the patients are hearing. They don't have to have an invasive test. So really, there's been an incredible commercial, absolutely commercial investment. This company here um, just um, put their patents together. This morning it was announced with this company for $500 million. This company was um, just sold yesterday to Roche. This company was sold for $460 million. So I just give you those numbers to show you the impact that genomic technology has um, and how it really has really become a commodity that's very, very lucrative. Um, however, what people don't hear is that it only identifies a few chromosomes. Non-invasive testing, as I said, 13, 18, 21, and sex chromosome abnormalities. If a woman's 35 or older, and she has an increased risk, and she has non-invasive testing, 30% of all chromosome abnormalities in that woman are not 13, 18, and 21, so she has a residual risk that if there's a chromosome abnormality, 30% of those would be missed. And if a woman has the old way of screening, in other words, the biochemistry, the nuchal translucency, um, et cetera, and she's screened positive, in which two years ago, if she were screened positive, she would have an invasive test that could identify any chromosome abnormality. Now, they've re replaced that with the non-invasive test, and I don't want to go into all the details here, but about 17% of the cases in which are screen positive will have chromosome abnormalities that are clinically relevant, very important, way more important than sex chromosome abnormalities that will not be identified. So, if a woman is screen positive who used to be offered an invasive test, who now opts for this new test without being told that it's very limited in its scope, her residual risk of a chromosome abnormality after she has the test is still 2%. So it's a dramatic improvement. There's nothing wrong with the test. The issue is somebody's got to be talking to these women and these doctors so that they actually understand the limitations and the scope of the screening test versus the diagnostic test. Um, 
this is just another study uh, that, that we did with the California um, prenatal uh, data in which there were almost half a million cases. And we asked a different question. We said, not how will you diagnose trisomies 18, 13, and 21, which I said is 99% or so. We said, I want to do the old test, which here is called sequential screening, versus the new cell-free DNA. But I'm asking a different question. What's the ability to diagnose any, any chromosomal abnormality, not just those? And you'll see that the new test will identify about 70% of all the chromosome abnormalities that the patient fetus may have, not counting microdeletions. Microdeletions are another 1%. These are just chromosome abnormalities. The old test will identify 80%. So if somebody's interested in certain specific chromosome abnormalities, non-invasive testing. If she's interested in um, finding any chromosome abnormality or any information, then there's no question that either an invasive test or the old test would be able to give her more information. So that's how we balance these things. This is the screening. This is the information they can get and it's differentiated by the diagnostic procedure, of which there are two diagnostic procedures, either amnio, where you put a needle in the amniotic fluid, or CBS, where you take a sample of the placenta. Until three years ago, everybody was saying, these tests are so safe, every woman might consider having them. There have been tons of studies that show the risk of losing a pregnancy because you have one of these is one in 500. And everybody thought that was a relatively low risk, well worth getting the information. More recently, with non-invasive testing, with people trying for lots of reasons to have people switch to that, it's now become, you don't want to have that dangerous test. Uh, you could lose a pregnancy. So maybe you want a limited amount of information, but you don't have to do that test. I can tell you, we all didn't become incompetent in three years. The test didn't get any more dangerous. It's just an example of perception and how it changes when one's options also are different, and also how it changes depending on how anything is presented to you. So what do we do about all this? Well, I'll show you that women have voted with their feet. This is the incidence of having an invasive test since 2008. Red is amniocentesis, blue is CVS. You can see that between 2007 and 2008, amnios fell 8%, CVS um, actually increased for a year or two. The next year, amnios fell another 9%. 2012, they fell 14%, and in 2013, they fell 26%. So since 2008 to 2014, there's been a 50 to 70 percent drop in the use of invasive procedures by patients. So I think it points out incredibly well of how the whole thing has changed, and it also proves how patients don't want to put their pregnancy at any risk whatsoever. But the problem is that they're not getting the whole story. And I can tell you that they're not being told. They're being told, we now have an invasive test for Down syndrome. Well, you and I know what Down syndrome is, but to a, well, most lay people, Down syndrome means chance of having a child that has mental retardation. They don't really understand that it's a distinct. It's like if I said to you, you know, go get me a Coke, you'd be okay getting me a, a brown soda. Well, a lot of people use the word Down syndrome for any child that has any birth defect or any abnormality. So that's just how telling people the words that you use to explain this really help people. So that now they're thinking that they can get a blood test, which will give all the information they could have from an invasive test, uh, and have no risk to their pregnancy. So really, in order to be fair, and this is all this is about, is fairness to our patients, we really have to begin that they understand the limited information that they're getting, and they have to have the opportunity to say, I want more information or I want less information and particularly those who are having cell-free or non-invasive prenatal testing who three years ago would have had an invasive test and they're now using this as a replacement have to understand that the replacement for some reasons isn't going to give them the same information and isn't as important. So how do we do this? Who should do it? Well, I think there's a certain amount of basic information that every person should be told before they decide which test they want to have. 
First of all, they should be told that chromosomal or cytogenetic abnormalities occur in approximately 2% of all pregnancies. Without that information, they really can't make uh, a decision. Two out of every 100 pregnancies will have a significant uh, cytogenetic problem. Of those, 0.6% are one of the chromosome abnormalities that will be identified by the blood test, and if you include microdeletions and duplications, 1.3% would be identified if they had an invasive test with, with microarray performed. They also have to be told that the cytogenetic, all cytogenetic abnormalities have significant clinical findings. Just because it's a smaller piece of DNA doesn't mean that the severe consequences of that or the consequences of that are much less. There are very severe problems with extra chromosomes. There are equally, if not more severe, problems with microdeletions that they might want to know about. And there's also mild problems. I mean, you would say autism and learning disorders are mild problems that you would identify with microarray, but also a sex chromosome abnormality, a child that may be infertile or may have some, those are mild problems too that you would identify with the other approach. So they need to understand that we're not looking at a different spectrum of disease, we're looking at a different frequency of disease. So then after they understand those two very simple points, they then have to make a decision. Do you want screening in which we would identify a limited number of chromosome abnormalities or do you want to have an invasive test? And as I said, the invasive test will give you all microdeletions and duplications, but has a 1 in 500 to 100 to 1 in 700. I can tell you, in New York, in which everybody having a perfect baby is the norm and they want to have the super perfect baby, there are tons of people that want as much genetic information. The same discussion in Utah or Alabama, people say, I don't even want to be tested for Down syndrome. So there really are differences in populations, but no matter where you come from, or no matter what your preconceived value system is, you at least need to know the information before you can apply it. So, who's going to do this? Every woman, every pregnant woman now, you're telling me, I have to say, Mrs. Smith, we have two options, you can get this test, it'll tell you this, we can get that test, it will tell you that. Well, who's the burden right now um, is falling on the obstetricians. Every non-invasive test, the lab requires that the ordering physician, which in this case is the obstetrician, and some uh, signs of form, that says, I certify that the patient has been informed of the benefits, risks, and limitations of the tests requested, et cetera, et cetera. In no way does it say they've been informed of the other options that are available. But the obstetricians now say, Mrs. Smith, we have this test. It has false positives and false negatives. Please sign here and send her to the laboratory. Obstetricians were, in general, trained to do this, to deliver babies. They were trained to do hysterectomies. They have incredible numbers of very complicated cases to take care of. Now we're adding to their burden. They have to start talking about detailed genetic options. Um, this is a slide that shows you how much time, the women that have gone to OBGYNs know this, how much time the doctor has to spend with you. Over 50% of obstetrician gynecologists have less than 10 to 15 minutes to spend with a patient. So how in the world are you going to be able to explain these things? And just for illustrative purposes, this is what the American College of OBGYN suggests that you talk to a patient about on her first prenatal visit. You talk to her about what kind of care she's going to have, her schedule of visits, what the course of the pregnancy is going to be. You have to tell her about any complications of pregnancies. You got to talk about breastfeeding. You got to talk about her other laboratories. You got to talk about exercise. You have to talk about smoking. There's an incredible number of things. And you then have to tell them about cystic fibrosis testing. You have to tell them if they're Jewish about Jewish disease testing. You have to tell them about fragile X testing. And then, by the way, you could either have NIPT or you could have um, invasive testing. Nobody can do this. It is impossible that the obstetrician can have and do the additional burden that we're asking them to do. This is what obstetricians would look like nowadays. I mean, they wouldn't even have time to eat. It would really be a, a giant problem. So let's not use obstetricians. Let's use genetic counseling. They're trained to do this. Let's look at the math. 
Genetic counseling for every obstetrical patient means every woman delivering in this country would have a, ma a meeting with an, a genetic counselor. There's four million births a year. We know for a fact about one-fourth of pregnant women don't want to hear anything about testing. Um, so there's only going to be about three million that would want to meet with a genetic counselor. Genetic counseling visits at best to describe this would be 30 minutes. That would mean at 15 minutes between cases, which is pretty routine, we would need 2.25 million counseling hours per year. If the genetic counselors did nothing, nothing but talk to pregnant patients about their, their options, um, we would need um, 1,125 additional um, full-time genetic counselors. And if they did half time talking to patients about this, and then they um, did the other half talking about what they were trained to do, which is a lot of other stuff, we would need 2,250. You know how many genetic counselors get trained a year? Um, this is up until 2006, somewhere between 200 and 250. So to get the number of genetic counselors that would be available to um, give this information, um, is almost absolutely impossible. Just not going to work. So this is the dilemma. How do we do this? It's important. And right now, I'm not blaming anybody, particularly obstetricians, for not giving people all the information they need. We're just asking them to do something that's really impossible. So do we go to group counseling? People that have done that have said it works. Other people who've done that said it's really not very popular and people don't like it. Do we do video counseling? Do we get a website in which um, patients can say, this is how I feel, this is what I want to know, and the computer, through some sort of calculation, will make a decision and inform the patient? Um, do we send them questionnaires? Or, and I hesitate to say this, do we change the paradigm? And this is where I think it gets a little squeezy. Do we really have to inform people of all the options that are available to them? I mean, can we say, Mrs. Smith, this is a genetic test for some really bad stuff, and if you have bad stuff, then you'll sit down with the counselor and we'll explain what that means. And he said, that's crazy. We can't do that. But one of the other things we've started doing is screening people. You know, we used to screen people for carrier state of things like Tay-Sachs or sickle cell based on their ethnicity, and there were about 20 tests. We now screen people with one test for a tenth of the money for over a hundred disorders. There's no way, and it's been agreed, that all you have to say to the patient before she gets the test is, I'm going to do a screening test for you and your husband to see if you carry a uh, recessive disease, and if you do, then you'll come back and I'll tell you what it means. Before, with, we used to say you have to sit down with every disease, you got to explain what it means, you got to ask if they want to be tested for this. Again, as we get these new tools, it's no longer feasible or possible. So can we, should we, will we change the paradigm of how or if we give patients genetic education and testing? This is the next step, which will make it even more complicated. There now has been really good science to demonstrate within three years all those microdeletions and duplications that I showed you you need to have invasive testing for will be able to be done non-invasively. It's just a matter of the price of sequencing getting cheaper and being able to do this. There have been two studies now that have sh shown beyond a shadow of a doubt that in a blood test drawn from a mom, you can do an entire sequence, an entire sequence of the fetus using some sequencing tricks. So we will now have the ability to draw blood from the mom, talk about all the same tests we're now getting with invasive testing, and more moving to sequence. What do we have to tell people before we draw that test? Is it ethical? Is it appropriate to say, we're going to draw a test, to test the, we're going to draw blood for you to test the fetus, and if there's bad stuff, we'll let you know what it is? Because at least now, when there's an invasive procedure versus a non-invasive procedure, you've got to sit down and they've got to think about whether they want that information and what risks. But once this is all non-invasive, and I'm not saying if it becomes non-invasive. The data is clear. It will become non-invasive for everything. What are we going to do? How are we going to tell them? How are we going to use this um, information? So really, that's where we stand. And where I could really use the input is nobody solved this problem yet. Not, you know, we're just at the beginning of, of understanding it. Um, so who can tell me what to do? <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it.
time here questions and comments or if you've got solutions this is the chance to offer that. Who sets up the criteria for this that the obstetrician has to yeah um, that's done by the American College of OBGYN. And it's across the country? Across national, that's the national guidelines. And you have to remember, OBGYNs, and this is what's really happened, they have no education in genetics. I mean, they have education in lots of important stuff. I mean, they've got to know menopausal hormones. They've got to know puberty. They've got to know how to treat an abnormal pap smear. Why do we think they're even going to begin to do this? There are people that know genetics. The other thing that I didn't mention, and I'm glad you brought this up, we call these people genetic counselors. Yet, I would say 80% of a lot of what they do is genetic education. Do we separate the education from the counseling? Use the really skilled, well-versed genetics people who are skilled at talking to people only when we have something to talk about that really requires counseling. And we train another group people that are called genetic educators, or we train the nurses in obstetrician's office who are educators. They don't have to know anything about genetics. Say, Mrs. Smith, these are your options. This is important. Read this here. And if you have any questions or you're not sure what to do, then go to the genetic counselor. Maybe it's time to separate those, those two roles. And I'd like to think, and you, know, you would know even better than I, this is unique to us. It's only unique to us because we're faced with it early because of non-invasive prenatal testing. These are issues that we're all going to have. You go to your interns. You could have a heck of a number of tests that you could get, you know, but who's going to tell them? Or should we tell them? I mean, you know, you go to get your cholesterol now. Somebody doesn't sit down with me and say, I'm going to get a cholesterol, and it can tell me if you're going to have a stroke. It's going to tell me if you're going to have hypertension. Just say, no, I'm going to get a cholesterol, and only if it's abnormal do they sit down and talk to me. So there's a little bit of genetic exceptionalism here, but it very well may be appropriate. But so, Ron, we've got some people who are listening in remotely on the phone, and if you're away from the mic, thank you. Oh, I am so sorry. <clears throat> yes? Fifteen years ago, my daughter-in-law was pregnant, and her obstetrician did a genetic screening and um, told her that she had um, was recessive or cystic fibrosis. She never asked for informed consent. She is this paradigm that you were talking about. And the doctor, I, I spoke with her, I said, how can you do this without informed consent? She said, well, in only maybe three out of 100 parents, women, will I have to say anything? Why make 97 women anxious waiting for the results of the test? I will just tell those people who have a problem that there's a problem. I was horrified, but now, after what you're saying, I'm thinking maybe that was the best thing. And, I, uh, I can guarantee you that the counselors over there, if somebody said these patients don't need counseling, you would be horrified, or do you agree? I'm just curious how they feel about it, because they are the ones that are trained to do this, and you see it every day, so. I personally think that it would be awesome if everybody could get counseling, but I practically recognize that that's currently not feasible, given the excellent way you broke down like, how many of us would be required to actually do that. So I don't have a good answer in terms of like what I think we should do, but I agree that it's, we're in this tricky place where I think it would be great if all women could get thorough counseling before they make a choice about non-invasive testing, but I don't know practically in the long run. <laughs> How that will be done. You see patients with both of you with structural anomalies with severe difficulties. How often do you hear patients say, I wish somebody had, I had been able to know about this beforehand, versus how often do they say when you tell them that they're at risk for something, oh I don't really even want to know about it. What do you think patients feel about this? Which is really the bottom line. Are you asking about during a pregnancy or after the child is... You tell me. That's a really good question. Yeah. She speak up? Yes, yeah, speak up. I'm sorry. I am a wanderer. Well, I mean, one wanderer. thing with patients who come to their genetic counseling appointments, they're self-selecting a large part that they want to know information. And so I think those people who want to hang their head in the sand, those are the ones that you see and you're getting a scan, but you don't ever hear about their genetic counseling appointment because they never show up. So it's a self-selecting there. Um, 
then I don't spend a lot of time asking families who have the child in the room with you, kind of, you know, if you had known about this prenatally, would you want to know about it? I mean, some people talk about that, of like, I did a lot of testing 